Our Old Testament story is a continuation of the Genesis stories that we've been reading throughout the summer. And this one particularly is the story of Joseph, who we know from the many colored coats and his dreams. And I've been dreaming a lot this week. Maybe it's dreaming of Joseph's dream and just thinking about this particular text. And one of my dreams was about how long this text is, how long this story is, and the reading is. And so I've been going back and forth. Could, could the congregation handle my reading of this text? And would you, would, you, um, would you stay with me and stay with this important story? And in the middle of this dream over here where um, Dwayne Bevel and Linda Shreve sit, it was about in that area, there were a group of hecklers, it could have been you all, that stood up, grabbed a pew Bible, and started reading while I was reading. Like, they were just like, let us get at this, because we can read this story. You're reading too much. So these hecklers, and, and I've been dreaming, and what do I do with this story? So I've changed the I've changed the, to the, the message, uh, Eugene Peterson's translation, thinking maybe that would be a little bit interesting to you all. The word of God is found in Genesis 37, the story of Joseph and his brothers. This is the story of Jacob. The story continues with Joseph. 17 years old at the time, helping out his brothers in herding the flocks. These were his half-brothers, actually, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah, and Joseph brought his father bad reports on them. Israel, Jacob, his father, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age. And he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. When his brothers realized that their fathers loved him, father loved him more than any of them, they grew to hate Joseph, and they wouldn't even speak to him. Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. This little section of five verses is about Joseph's dreams. He actually had two dreams, and one of them was about his father as well, all of them bowing down and serving him. His brothers had gone off to Shechem where they were pasturing their father's flocks and Israel said to Joseph, your brothers are with flocks in Shechem, come, I want to send you to them. Joseph said, I'm ready. Jacob said, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring me back a report. He sent him off from the valley of Hebron to Shechem. A man met Joseph as he was wandering through the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? I'm trying to find my brothers. Do you have any idea where they're grazing their flocks? The man said, they've left here, but I've overheard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph took off, tracked his brothers down, and found them in Dothan. They, they spotted, spotted him, him off, off in the, in the distance. distance. But By the, the time, time he got, they got to them, to they had cooked up a plot to kill him. The brothers were saying, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of those old cisterns. We can say that a vicious animal ate him up. We'll see what his dreams amount to. Reuben heard the brothers talking and intervened to save him. We're not going to kill him. No murder. Go ahead and throw him in this cistern out in the wild, but don't hurt him. Reuben planned to go back later and get him out and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him, and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was dry. There wasn't any water in it. Then they sat down to eat their supper. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way from Gilead, their camels loaded with spices, ointments, and perfumes, to sell in Egypt. Judah said, Brothers, what are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let's not kill him. He is, after all, our brother, our flesh and our blood. His brothers agreed. 
By that time, the Midianite traders were passing by. His brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. Later, Reuben came back and went to the cistern. No Joseph. He ripped his clothes into despair. Beside himself, he went to his brothers. The boy is gone. What am I going to do? They took Joseph's coat, butchered a goat, and dipped the coat in the blood. They took the fancy coat back to their father and said, We found this. Look it over. Do you think this is your son's coat? He recognized it at once. My son's coat, a wild animal, has eaten him. Joseph torn from limb to limb. Jacob tore his clothes in grief, dressed in rough burlap, and mourned his son a long, long time. His sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused their comfort. I'll go to the grave mourning my son. Oh, how his father wept for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So how do you meet hecklers face on? You invite them in and you have them read. Sarah didn't heckle me, but that was the way I chose to deal with it. Let's have a prayer. Gracious and almighty God, what a word and a story you have woven through the ages, bringing us in, pouring your promises upon us. May we move our faith from our heads to our hearts and open them so that you might speak to us this day. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Dutch master painter Rembrandt only painted one seascape in all of his works, and it was the storm on the Sea of Galilee. It was one of his most dramatic paintings, capturing that moment just after the disciples knew that they would die if Jesus didn't save them, and just before he did. Everyone who looked at it saw the same thing. Rembrandt, in this particular painting, had painted himself in the middle of the story, in the middle of the storm, between the light and the dark, the surge of the waves and the calm of Jesus. His right hand is clutching a rope and his left is pinning his hat on top of his head. He is staring out at the viewer with with intensity. He's looking at us. Rembrandt's name is scrawled on a useless rudder. It is as though this is his boat and his sea and everyone is caught up in his storm. He and everyone else in the ship are soon to be lost unless their leader intervenes. It was said that Rembrandt was as much of a storyteller as he was a painter. He cared about the narratives behind his paintings and he painted them to tell, the, tell a story as much as anything that he could do in a single frame. By painting himself in, he invites us in, draws us in, capturing our imagination, instructing us on how we should relate to what is happening on the canvas. By painting himself in the boat, Rembrandt wants us to know that he believes his life will either be lost in a sea of chaos or preserved by the Son of God. Those are his only two options. And by peering through the storm and out out of the frame at us, he asks us, aren't you in the same boat? Our New Testament lesson is one of two storms on the sea that, that the Gospel of Matthew tells. The one that we read or Dan read earlier actually is only told by Matthew where Jesus walks on the water towards the disciples. The disciples are as much frightened in that particular story by Jesus. It's a ghost, they say. And still, as Rembrandt implies, each story invites us to see ourselves in 
being tossed and turned by life. Our Old Testament reading is the story of Joseph, the dreamer thrown in a pit, a dry cistern, a dry well, by his older brothers who are fed up with their father's star child who is number one, or maybe first grade. Probably he goes somewhere in between. Should Rembrandt have painted that story, I would dare imagine that he would draw himself as crawling to the edge of the cistern, looking down, but also looking back at us. Are we in a ship without an oar? Are we in a cistern without a ladder? Which is it for you? Life tosses us around and we're not sure how we will survive it or if we will. This has been a summer of the stories of Genesis. There are stories of God's promise to establish a people and the proclivity of humankind, those people that God chooses to mess up what is good, to mess up God's promise. We have, through the summer, been spending time with people who are at the heart of our faith, Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and brother Ishmael, Jacob and his brother Esau, and now Joseph. It's been stories of the younger brother, actually. It's true true in today's story as well. It begins with the call of Abraham to follow God to a place that God says, I'll show you the faithfulness of Abraham to go where he does not know, but trusting that God will lead him there. And God will also bless Abraham with a family, with a purpose, a people, a place, a purpose, if you like alliteration. This is a blessing, says Walter Brueggemann, that is a generational blessing, a blessing that is not just meant for Abraham, but it is a blessing that is meant for the family. And God is the center of this blessing. That relationship with God, God at the center, is what is being passed down from parent to child. What we will find in each story is that the blessing is always under threat at being lost or at least we think so. If we are paying attention, we should be sitting on the edge of our seats. Can we trust God to save the story, to make good on God's promise, to do what God says that he will do? This is something behind the fear of the disciples of Jesus saying, oh, you of little faith, can we trust God? The story begins this way. This is the history of the family of Jacob. And then the next 13 chapters are about Joseph. Not about Jacob. But they are about Jacob and his family. Genesis tells us this is really about Jacob, who has been named Israel, if you'll remember, through whom this entire nation will come into being. However, the storyteller was right in indicating that something new is happening here. So in the story of Jacob, we learn about Joseph. Something is happening. Brueggemann says, the Joseph narratives are distinct from what was called the tribal or the ancestral narratives of the stories that have gone before Joseph. In the Joseph stories, there's a cool detachment from things religious. We are witnessing a generation of believers in a cultural climate where the old modes of faith are embarrassing The old idiom of faith has become unconvincing. The narrative should be understood as a sophisticated literary response to cultural and theological crisis. What will happen to the faith? The presence of God is unknown in the Joseph stories. 
until the very end. The name of God is not spoken. No voice calls out in personal ways, no angelic presences. The Lord is not showing up at the foot of a ladder of angels. There is no wrestling with strangers in the middle of the night. And yet, and yet, the purposes of God are at work, hidden and unnoticed. God's presence in the stories of Joseph are not tangible. We have to work harder at being attuned to where God is. And though God is not obvious, nonetheless, the ways of God are reliable and will come to fruition. God is mysterious. No abrupt actions or instructions, but now God is present in the ways that seem natural and contiguous. That will be the hindsight of the full story of Joseph. But in the pit, that's where we are today, in this dry well, deep down, too deep to get out by himself, things are ugly and things are broken between these brothers. One of the subtle ways of God has come, ironically, through these dreams that Joseph has had. Joy J. Moore calls Joseph the first prophet that is mentioned in the Bible. God gives Joseph dreams. You know, there's a plaque at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, and it bears these words. And they said to one another, Behold, here comes the dreamer. Let us slay him, and we shall see what becomes of his dreams. It was only a dream, but dreams are powerful and would be Joseph's undoing and others as well. Joseph, the dreamer, is the youngest, and he is the beloved son The older brothers have no time for him. Their father makes no secret that he is their favorite and he relishes it. Perhaps we can excuse it that Joseph is young. He's naive. He's clueless. He's not paying attention to to what his brothers think. But Joseph parades around his status and his gifts and his dreams before his brothers with a, hey, look at this, as if his privilege would be their joy. But behind his back, they're calling him daddy's boy and dreamer. Somehow they sense that a dream can change things, or perhaps that Joseph's dream carried a different kind of weight. How is it that when we hear and listen to the dreams of others. That many times dreams are often so fantastical, out of reach, unbelievable, or believable enough that they can be threatening and frightening. There was something to Joseph's dreaming that set a trajectory for this family's mess, and yet God is in this dream. Pastor Michael Fick writes that sacred imagination envisions a time of God's redemption. Sacred stories like this one preserve the need to identify small graces that can engender hope for the hopeless. New dreams for those in the pit. Love for those feeling far from the love of God. Joseph's brothers declare it is the pit where they will see what becomes of their brother's dreams. For they are jealous of the coat and the love and the dreams themselves. Fick adds, amid great difficulty, what will become of our dreams? 
the dreams of a world transformed by God's mercy and grace, lifting up those who have gone down in the pit. It is a small redemptive act by Brother Reuben that sets in motion an arc through which God will only save Joseph, not only save Joseph, but save an entire nation of people. This moment of grace in a strange relationship is transformative for Reuben and Joseph. God makes a way to hope in the middle of a pit. This week's Old Testament reading is a lesson in the name Israel. In order to survive this story, one must hang on and fight for the presence of God with the tension and harm done within the family of promise. It is not a pretty story, but it is very real. So all of our Bible scholars say that we need to look a little bit more deeply for how God is working in the midst of the story, which is squashing dreams and killing dreamers. And yet to realize that God himself and the message and the promise of God is in the midst of those dreams. How shall we dream, people? How shall we dream? I found um, a small grace for us in a very unlikely place. Bilal um, Qureshi, who writes for NPR Pop Culture, says that a dream has been happening throughout this summer in what is being called Girl Summer. Qureshi writes on this phenomenon, and if you've missed it, there are sold-out screenings of the Barbie movie. There are sold-out stadiums of devotees of the singer Beyonce Knowles and Taylor Swift. Some of you have gone to those, I know. Hearts beating as one, they, they are dressing in sparkles and belting out beloved tunes side by side as if this great chorus of thousands of voices wearing identical outfits. The mood is in each way strategic but not subversive. It is a message that they are sending of intentional inclusion. All three of these are saying, these movements in this girl summer are saying, we get you, we see you, you belong here. Director Greta Gerwig and Taylor Swift and Beyonce Knowles have created in each of their new masterworks what he calls dream worlds, a thinking of a better time a better day. Critics outside are looking in and they're wondering, is this consumer madness? Cumulative decline in seriousness and taste? But the answer is a resounding no. Americans of all races and genders and ages and religions are devoting time and attention and resources to being part of this moment. There is critical acclaim for all these worlds. No one is asking for their money back. The roaring return of big trend monoculture follows the ennui of lockdowns. The closing of each of these spectacles is a kind of transfer of energy and exuberance and optimism that has been absent from public and cultural life for years. Not a cruel, but a communal collective. Humor me here. But with all the brokenness and divisive talk and mean-spiritedness going on, in our society, in our neighborhoods, in our families. This comes as a glimmer on the horizon for hundreds of thousands who feel like in this arena they have been to church. Could we be witness to the smallest of spiritual graces on secular stages? Just wondering. 
It is a message of intentional inclusion. You belong here. We see you. Michael Fick writes that threaded throughout this story, this Jacob story, are the smallest of graces. We might call them God winks. Eldest brother Reuben intentionally says, let's not kill this brother of ours. This God wink of saying, let's rescue the dream. A caravan of traders arrives at the time, just at the time when the brothers are discussing how to dispose of the body, and the smallest of graces are the ones that we need to pay attention to in our own lives. Of how God shows up in quiet ways to bring grace and mercy. The smallest of graces are the ones that we need to pay attention to in our own lives when the winds threaten to capsize us, when the pits are too deep to get out of by ourselves. Where is God leaning in to show us a dream for a better day? That's where we need to be paying attention. Peter starts sinking when he hears the roar of the wind speaking over the voice of Jesus. That's true for us, too. When we begin to sink because we've gotten our eyes off of Christ. One of our early artist friends at Favo was Berto Ortega. Berto was a painter, and he drew much of his style from the technique of Rembrandt. He painted less from form and more from the way that light and dark played off of his subjects. And like Rembrandt, Berto also told a story, often inserting himself into his paintings. One example of this is a piece that he gave to to us at Park Lake and that hangs in our chapel area on the other side of this wall. It is Good Friday, the end of the day from John's Gospel. Jesus hangs on the cross. We can only see the bottom of his legs and his feet. And the three Marys are standing at the base of the cross, and they're grieving, staring in disbelief. Berto told me that after he painted the Marys, he knew that he should be there too. So he painted himself as one of those who stood beneath the cross at the foot of Christ, believing and trusting, and in spite of the world's cruelty and the world's brokenness, that the dream of a better day would come, that God would save that he stood between the promise and the dream and the fulfillment and invites us to stand there as well. Amen.